After three days, he has come for uh, school to teach uh, one of the sophisticated uh, uh, course that is used uh, in, you know, in the international community, community to, to calculate uh, quantities for ion energy physics. It's one of the most uh, sophisticated, powerful, and widely used course. And he's one of the originators. And uh, he is not just known for this, he's known for several other important contributions in high energy physics, particular top physics, Higgs physics, dark matter, name anything, I, I think he has a, a paper on it actually, and well cited paper. Um, and he, to say a few words about his you know, life, you know, he started. Uh, I think you are from Italy, I think. He's <laughs> from Italy and then uh, he graduated from Pisa and then moved to Urbana Champagne, the unknown physicist there, and then moved to Rome, Rome to CERN as a fellow, and then uh, CERN to again back to Louis in Belgium. So that's uh, is. Uh, uh, trajectory and is now here to teach us. Today is going to talk about. Uh, okay, it's difficult to read. <laughs> you can read actually. <laughs> I can't read. Okay, so let me welcome uh, Matthew. Uh, okay, thanks very much, uh, Rani, for this nice introduction and uh, of course thanks to uh, you as I am C. Uh, MCSC for the invitation uh, to be here is a great honor for all of us um, and we are in, in great time. So let me, uh, let me start with a title which I would have liked to give to the talk but was certainly pretentious so I, at the end I didn't but I'm showing it anyway. Um, LHC physics, uh, I'm a collider physicist, I work on, on the LHC and uh, LHC physics is uh, uh, becoming uh, uh, an, exciting, uh, an exciting activity right now because it is becoming more difficult and people are thinking about ways of uh, attacking the problem of uh, which is uh, the main problem that we all have whether there is new physics at scale which we can still probe or not and that, uh, and that allowed basically uh, people to also um, devise or think about the way we are doing such searches of new physics. So the, in the literature, uh, for those of you who are passionate of philosophy, uh, there is this story uh, that has been taken actually by after Mark Kirchhoff and then Erasmus later and then a book, uh, a famous book of the 50s by uh, Isaiah Berlin, where, you know, in device thinkers in two big categories, and one are foxes and one are hedgehogs. And now hedgehogs thrive in the moment where there is a big idea and, uh, and they can go and develop it and thrive when the system is stable. And it's, the, the boundary conditions are known and uh, they, can, um, they can think, right? Uh, about the big idea that explained everything. So uh, Aristoteles, Plato was one of these hedgehogs. So, while foxes thrive in periods where of great uncertainty. And the strategies they use are, are different. And so for example, uh, you know, this is more like a top-down and bottom-up approach uh, in our language. And uh, what they think is that there is no single idea which can explain the world, but they try actually to explore new approaches and new ideas in a bottom-up way. So, for many years, and I think we still are doing a very good job as Android, and uh, but nowadays, uh, more and more, we are thinking a bit about the future, what LHC is going to bring us, and we are more and more thinking a bit more in terms of Android, uh, of foxes. So, this is a bit of a point of view, which I'm going to try to explain uh, today, how we think about this way of addressing the search for new physics. So this is a true title of my talk, and my lecture today. So I will focus a bit on uh, 
the potential that uh, known particles, the particles that we have seen, like the Higgs and the soft quark, which are the heaviest particle in the standard model, which kind of potential these particles have to bring us or to show us the way towards uh, new physics. So before doing that, let me just thank again uh, everybody uh, who has contributed to this fantastic week. So we have in this school, we will we just stop now and we'll continue after, because our, our students are never, uh, are never satisfied with what we learn. They want to learn more, which is great. We are very happy about that. So there's a bunch of, of people who I really want to thank that came uh, this way uh, to teach at the school. There are about 10 of them. Most of them have fly uh, overseas. And then we have our students there and our hosts uh, fraction and Ravindram that very kindly organized this uh, on our side. So we had the first exercise already, a first group of exercise in the school. And the, and the exercise uh, was asked to draw an in, a map of India and say where you are from. So I want to report the results now. So there's been a first try, this is the first uh, uh, plot. So this is a theory, theory prediction. And number one, we had another theory prediction, number two, and you see they are quite similar, actually. So our theory prediction agree roughly one way down, with one with another, and then you see the, the various instances in India where our students are from. And then finally, there is experimental data. Uh, and now you can judge yourself whether the uh, agreement uh, is good or not, to many, uh, how many sigmas we agree in experimental measurement, and to which order you think this prediction is. I would call it leading order for the moment, right? Even though we have features which are next to next, so you see, there are, you know, there are very small details which have been caught on the blackboard. And so this is a bit, uh, you know, the formation, right? The formation of our mind. We always see, we always, and see this, we always try to make predictions, of course, and try to verify them. Uh, against data. So it's the, the topic of this lecture. So we go now to the LSE results. Uh, and the game is similar. Maybe it's more people working on it, a bit more sophisticated and ambitious in the goals. But then the, the idea is the same. So this plot shows, for those of you who are not experts, uh, a series of um, processes on the x-axis. So these are beams uh, showing uh, points. And each point is a measurement of a cross-section, or and uh, a theory prediction. So the theory prediction are not very visible, are gray lines behind. But what is interesting in this plot, that there is a wide variety of processes, which are those as predicted in our standard model, the model, st standard model of the fundamental interaction. There are many of them, and they, they are ordered by decreasing cross-section. The cross-section is shown on the y-axis, and you see there are many order of magnitude span by, uh, by this axis, which means that uh, we are using the same model to predict uh, processes which have very different probabilities of even uh, 10 order of magnitudes or more among them. So it's an enormous span right, of, uh, um, of sensitivity. Right? It's more or less the same as our ear, actually. You know that our ear is sensitive to 10 to the 12 uh, difference in energy, and that's more or less the same. So this is the, the ear of the LHC uh, listening to physics, uh, in this case, of the standard model. And these are very feeble uh, signals, but still we have already measurement here. And you see that if you just by eye, you look for the theory, uh, you don't see any, any basically any green uh, few of them, because they are all behind the colored one which means that there is a, a substantial agreement between what we measure at LHC and what we predict from theory. So this is the status. Someone like me thinks that this plot is very exciting. It's our ability to make prediction. Others that have worked maybe in discovering new physics or uh, a specific model uh, during their life are a bit disappointed that there is no chance fix here or a stop or something new that uh, was more or less expected. So this is a great story, a great success. This uh, is round one and round two already data. 
And then our attention, you see, will, will be around starting from this mean on. So we are looking for processes, and we'll be discussing processes, which have thoughts and kicks in their final state, and try to understand why these are particularly interesting. So this is the standard model story. What is the beyond the standard model search story? So this is one of the plot that the big collaboration Atlas and SMS produce. And they summarize the searches in a snapshot in a very somewhat uh, synthetic way. It's a bit superficial also, but as in all these cases, we have to have a trade-off. So these are results which basically show the lower bound on the uh, masses of particles for new states, which we have been looking for. So nowadays, we look for states. So the axis here, you see, is a log scale. Here, there is 1 TV. Here, there is 10 TV. And here, 20, 30, and so on. And you see that there are limits uh, for particles, uh, which are like Z prime, or W prime, or electroquarks, uh, or uh, uh, extra scale of extra dimension, and so on, which are of the order, most of them, between 1 and 10 TV. So this is a typical, it's encoded in a way we call the reach, the ability that this detector has to discover new resonances. In fact, if you look carefully, in this plot, there is already a bit the story which I'm trying to explain today, a gist of the story we are, we are going to discuss a bit, is here. You see that there are some, some uh, of these lines which actually go over 10 TV. And we know that the energy of the LHC is 13 TV, but it's 13 TV in the proton rest frame. So we know that the available one is actually lower than that. So one might wonder how, how are you going to put a limit here, which is higher than the, the energy of my detector? How can that be? Right? I don't have enough energy to produce something as heavy as this scale here. But then if you actually look at the fine print here, I'm not showing it in detail. This is not a mass of a particle. It's something else. It's something which we uh, call the scale of new physics. It's something where we somewhat know that new uh, physics, so new phenomena, will take place. This kind of search is very different from this one, where I'm looking for resonance. I'm looking for particle to be produced. So what are the strategies in general that we use uh, in new physics? This is a slide I've shown already in the lecture. So we have complementary strategies. We have complementary ways of looking for new physics. Uh, most of the work has been done on this left-hand side. Uh, we mostly thought about new physics model. We have worked for years, for decades, on new physics. Uh, and therefore, as soon as our acceleration was on, we looked for the existence of new states. Choose it, we have a model, acceleration, you name it. Um, so this will show up most of the time by producing resonant new states that would decay and leave uh, some tracks in our detector. And the way also we look for this new kind of physics is trying to identify signatures, so final state, uh, ways of showing up in the detector that are not uh, foreseen by the standard model, something intrinsically new that the, the cross-section for in the standard model is very small. On the other hand, uh, there has been also a class of searches which has been uh, less, uh, uh, less studied because just because they, were, they are more difficult. Uh, they are more difficult to implement. They are more difficult to think about. And also, they are more difficult in a, in a philosophical way. Why? Because you want to have, you would dream, right, to look at your data in a way that you have no bias from theory. That whatever is in your data that is new, you would discover it just because it's different with respect to your standard model prediction. So this is one way, and uh, this class uh, of uh, searches uh, falls in this second category, in the Fox category, let's say, is uh, the search for new interactions, so the way that particles which are known do interact among themselves, uh, and the search also for deviations from the signatures that we know already we will see in our detectors. So in a, I'm going to choose uh, this uh, dichotomic direction. So I'm going to try 
to argue, right, that in the past, the, what, the way we have been discovering the Higgs uh, has been in this uh, resonance way. And the resonance way is somewhat, we need very little, right, from theory to make a discovery. We need a lot once we want to understand what we have discovered. But to make, you know, to make the discovery itself, we might not need very much. On the other hand, if we want to look for new interactions, the game is completely different. So we are, uh, uh, we are in front of a challenge, and the challenge is shown in a nutshell in this plot, when you see a distribution for a given observable, this is an invariant mass of the two Ws, you see a standard model prediction, and you see now in violet here in purple, the prediction that we expect from a model where there is new physics, new physics hiding at scales which are higher than the scale where we make the measurement. Okay, so we expect new particles, let's say, at 3 or 4 TV, and what we are measuring is only distribution below it. So what do we expect? We expect a small change. We expect a change which is larger in the tails of the distribution, where unfortunately, however, I have less, less data, and a change in the bulk of the distribution which is smaller. So this is a game which is completely different to play. We have to have a strategy, because if we played in a naive way, we would never have a sensitivity to reach scales which go beyond the scale of the latency. So it's a game, as I repeat, if we played it naively, we will not get any result. The only way is to really play it fully and to try really to combine all the information we have from all experiments, this collider and the colliders, but also outside. So this is a bit the story of direct and indirect searches. That's the language which uh, normal particle physics use. For example, take a Lagrangian of, a, of an extension of, a, of a, a standard model where I add a singlet. Uh, this is a Z2 even singlet, so it mixes with the standard model, Higgs. So I have two ways of discovering this model. Either I see the extra scalar state, or since this mixes with the Higgs, the Higgs coupling will be changed. In, in particular, it will be slow, smaller than what I expect from the standard model. These two directions are orthogonal. They don't talk to each other, really. One is a precision measurement of the Higgs coupling. The other one is a search for the new state. Direct measurement, indirect measurement. How do they fare? Well, and this is an interesting plot, because in this case, in this model, they more or less fare nowadays in the same way. So this is a limit on the uh, mixing parameter. And you see that, uh, for example, these are the direct searches, and the other lines are the measurement, which are th this flat thing, which does not depend on the mass of the heavy state. It's coming from precision measurement on an alpha from the Higgs. Uh, and you see it's flat, and this green one is the direct one. So you see they more or less fare similarly. There is no clear winner here. It depends very much on your ability, your increasing energy, luminosity, but also on your precision. So this is a very simple example where actually this competition is clearly visible for a weak state. So indirect, eh, the measurement of the Higgs coupling, direct, the discovery of the search for a resonance. So now it's time for a citation, right? So uh, here, uh, this is the politically correct version uh, amended. So he or she who knows the art of direct and indirect approaches will be victorious. So who said that? Anybody? It's not Fabiola Giannotti. It's not the CERN director. It's not me, but is actually is a sentence of 2,500 years ago, and uh, you might find it in the, in the Arthur work. So he knew already about uh, heat scuffling and everything. You know, this is what I call a vision, right? So this guy had a vision clearly because what he said we can still apply it to everyday life. Okay. So now the question is, uh, okay, fine. I say that you have argued for 10 minutes about the indirect searches, and you told us that somewhat we need a strategy. We need something solid 
to do it. Because if we do it, naively we will not get anywhere. So what should we use? Eh? What is the language that we should use for this? So the answer is actually going back, usual, to our teachers. Eh? That's something that in time of crisis we all do, and it helps a lot. So we go back uh, to Fermi, for example, and we think in terms of an effective field theory. So what is the idea? The idea is that instead of using a wealth of new physics models, simplified or not, we try to have a model independent approach, which is completely general, and where we can perform our computation, our prediction, in a systematic and improvable way. So this language, we call it nowadays the standard model EFT, is simply the addition of higher dimensional operator to the renormalizable Lagrangian of dimension 4 that we all know uh, from school. Okay? So there is a way of thinking about the standard model measurement LHC program uh, that is coming along and will be coming along in the next 10, 15 years. And then I can reinterpret all the standard model measurement that we are doing in terms of, of bounding or searching for couplings eh, which go beyond the standard model Lagrangian and belong to this class of higher dimensional operators. So here, I mean, Sol is uh, writing the dimension six one. There are enough uh, that we can worry about them, uh, as I will show in a moment. So we don't have to worry right now. We don't have. We can worry about higher dimensional one, but it's not right time simply because we don't have the sensitivity yet to do that in most cases. In some cases we do. So the idea is just this. Treat the standard model as an effective field theory, and then this effective theory will be the limit of any, basically, UV completion, any theory we might leave at higher scale, and then we'll look for imprints of this heavy theory in my low energy measurement, low energy will be several TV measurements that I see, in all the observables that I will be able to measure. So we all know the idea of an EFT, right? So you have a scale. If your energy of your collider is above that scale, let's say the mass of the Z prime, I can produce it resonantly. I can actually see it like a bright here. This Z prime will decay, for example, in TT bar. However, if I'm below the mass of the Z prime, I can still produce a T prime, a T bar through a Z prime, but this Z prime will be not on shell, right? The virtuality of Z prime will be lower than the its mass, and then I can approximate this uh, production, this scattering amplitude, with a 4.1 for Fermi interaction, exactly as Fermi did more than 50 years ago. Uh, for uh, the weak and the beta decay. Okay, so this is a bit the idea. The idea is very simple. So this diagram now will be proportional to g squared over m squared, and therefore I can build a Lagrangian, which now has a dimension six operator, right? The four fermion is a dimension six. Each field has three and a half, and this will give a, a, an addition to the Lagrangian will modify, will deform, we say in jargon, is a deformation of the standard model in a way that we can bound by measuring whether, by bounding these coefficients, which are called the um, Wilson coefficient. There is now a glaring example of this, uh, which somewhat it seems to work, and which are the mass of the neutrino. We all know that there is only one dimension five operator in the standard model, so that if I had a EFT blind way of addressing the problem, I would have better than the first thing I would discover of new physics would have been a Majorana neutrino. And that's maybe that's what is going on. We don't know yet if a Majorana, if neutrino have Majorana masses, but it's plausible, right? And in that point of view, that's the first you can consider this the first success of this approach. So for dimension five operator, there is only one. How do we fare for the others? Well, uh, less well, let's say, right? Because there is not only one operator. So you're asking how many ways I can deform the standard model with dimension six operators? Well, a fair amount, 
actually. And uh, these are all the operators when I don't include the flavor, right, flavor differences. I'm showing only one generation or there are flavor indices hidden. So there are a fair number of operators which are there. In fact, there are, these are half of them because there is another half uh, which are uh, the four Fermi one, which I'm not showing right now. However, even though this looks like super complex, there are 59 operators per generation, they become more than 2,000 if we don't have any fear of flavor or assumption of flavor. However, after a while, this structure becomes familiar and we get to know them. So people who work in this business get to recognize them. They even have a name now. So this is called Yukawa. Uh, this is the Higgs potential, as I will, I will show. This is a change in the kinetic energy of the, uh, of the, phi, of the phi doublet. These are called dipoles. Uh, these are currents. Each one of them has some kind of characteristics which I've learned uh, to, um, to understand and to uh, use it uh, to put bounds on new physics. So how does this work in general? What is new somewhat with respect to the past. Well, uh, the, the, the rationale here is that this new Lagrangian satisfies the same symmetries of the standard model. So this helps us, a standard model, a high energy. So above uh, SU2 times U1 breaking. So this constraint limits, actually, the number of interactions that we can write and help us in categorizing them. So the only assumption of this Lagrangian is that the new physics is heavier than the scale we are probing at any given experiment. The other feature, which is somewhat misunderstood, uh, at least in school, in the way we are taught about that, is the fact that this Lagrangian is as renormalizable as the use of standard model. Okay. In the same sense that the standard model is in slightly weaker sense, but not concerning the, interact, the QCD and the electroweak interaction. For QCD, electroweak interaction is exactly the same sense. So if you fix the order in, in perturbation theory in lambda, in the lambda expansion that you work with, each order, order by order, this model is renormalizable with respect to QED, QCD and electroweak interaction. Okay, so this is super important for people who care about precision because it means that all these predictions can be improved at higher order exactly as we improve those of the standard model. So this is a key point which actually has uh, allowed uh, now to, to be able to make uh, predictions which are in line or getting closer to the level of accuracy and precision we can reach from the standard model. So how does it work? Uh, remember, the way it works is a bit like V physics, right? So you have a UV completion, you have some kind of Lagrangian high scale, you match it at some high scale, and then you run it down at the scale where you do the experiment. Okay, so how many V physicists are in the audience? Anybody? Yeah, so you should be familiar with this, right? So what you guys do normally, you actually take the standard model and you go, a weak scale, and then you run it down at the mass of the V. And then, then you study your interactions down there, and you see what are the imprints of new physics, which might live there, but you go down up to here. You do even a double matching sometimes. So this is exactly, so we are trying to do, if you want, V physics and LHC in the sense of high scale. So we are reproducing the same approach, but higher scale. There are features, however, which are intrinsically different from what B physics, uh, which need to be appreciated. And one of them is that so what B physics is tied to the mass of the B, right? It's something that happens at 5 GV. While here, the scales which we, which we explore are not fixed uh, at V or twice V. We have a range. Uh, and therefore, this gives us more leverage because we can have this tail behavior with increasing energy, okay? So it's not only an overall change, but only in the change, also in the change of distribution. So why am I, uh, I'm saying this? Because there is a one very important point 
that we have all to remember is the fact that this operator in this evolution now, this operator run, which means their importance changes, but they also mix. And mixing means that if you start with one operator, a low and high energy, then a low energy will have several of them. In general, all operators that mix among themselves will give uh, a signature, will give some kind of contribution, a low energy. This we see all the time in leaf physics, right? You start with some operator, then goes out, and other are switched on. And one example that I can show here, this is a complicated plot. I don't, I don't mean now that we go understand the details, but just to give you an idea, this is a, a, a RGE flow, uh, for those who know a bit the language. And here is an example where at one TV, I switch on only one of these two operators. You see one, this coefficient is one, the other one is zero. And now if I run down at the mass on the top, this one, CTG, is basically the same. This guy now is one half, it's coefficient. So even if I had a model where at high energy there was no, this operator was zero, at low energy, this operator will be on. So why I care about this? Because there is a, this impacts our strategy. We cannot build a strategy based on, measure, based on measurement of single couplings at a time. This is what we have been using in the past with this anomalous coupling formalism approach when we were switching on one coupling at a time. If we want to do an EFT, this is not feasible. Not, we cannot go this way. Simply because there is no model, physical model, a new V, where which in the, in the infrared will look like one parameter on at the time, in general. So if we want to play this game, we need to measure these couplings at low energy, low energy is now TV, right, the LHC, together, all together, because uh, otherwise our measurement, it cannot be interpreted. Okay, you can still do it, of course, but cannot be interpreted in this sense. So you need, in, in a few words, you need a global constraining strategy. You need a global fit. It's a bit like with the neutrinos, right, when we want to combine experimenting neutrinos, we do a global fit. It's a bit like flavor, when we want to understand different measurement, we need a global fit, and so on. This is not different, because it's similar. It's an effective field theory, exactly as the other two which I mentioned. So it's the same philosophy, it's not like a model top-down where you look at the signature you check. In this case, you need some kind of global approach. Summary up to here. So there is a large number of operators in general. We are not restricted to one or two. We have probably tens of operators we have to take care at a given time. So these operators enter in uh, observables in, let's say, in a linear way for today. Let's simplify. So each observable uh, depends on a linear combination of these operators. So now you see the game, right? The game is that I need enough observables that I can solve the system. And the system has to be at least redundant uh, to be able to get information on this coefficient ci. Then what I need uh, I can exploit a kind of a CISO uh, I, uh, mechanism. I, and, uh, it's a bit an abusive word here. But just to, to make clear right, that as our ability to bound these coefficients improves, uh, so as theta, so the upper bound, gets smaller, then the larger will be the lower bound of new physics that we will put. Okay. So that means that precision means reach. Now, if you look at this formula, it looks a bit complicated, but there is also a scale in the problem. You always need a scale. If this scale is the energy of your collision, then you realize immediately that your reach increases. Because this number can be large, never larger than lambda squared, but can be large. Then a, a given bound can be leveraged to give a, a much higher lower bound of lambda. So this is what is different than LHC. We can also use measurement at high energy to leverage on this behavior 
of higher dimensional operator which tend to scale with a behavior which is higher in energy. However, we should always keep in mind in the interpretation that uh, square root of s has to be smaller than lambda for the, for the theory in itself to make sense. So which interaction we are going to focus on? Well, if you look at what we have learned so far in collider physics, well, we know very well the interaction between light fermions and gauge bosons because they've been tested in the lab and the high degrees of precision, typically below the fermion. We know the self-interaction of the gauge bosons pretty well at the order of percent level from lab 2. Remember, lab 2 was the first time we could actually produce two Ws on shell, so we could test the Z and photon coupling from the Ws, the three linear. But however, there are already studies which show that LHC is competitive, can be competitive with this, with this measurement in the percent level, just because of this energy enhancement. And then we have the Higgs. The Higgs is a newly discovered particle. Uh, it's seven years old. And of course, we know already a lot, but not yet enough, uh, as much as we could learn. So this is a plot, for example, which relates fermion coupling to the weak coupling. And you see that we can bound uh, pretty well now in this combined uh, dot, uh, uh, black dot here, the couplings uh, to, uh, to vector bosons and to fermions. And then there are these plots, which I'm not going to describe, where basically the, 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 the message is that the measurements are all around one, and the uncertainties of measurement of this global scaling of this coupling is around a percent, 10 percent, 20 percent level. So this is like the precision we can achieve right now. And this also mirrors it in uh, this plot, which we've been discussing in school also. It's a plot which relates the, the relation and the prediction in the standard model between the particle mass and uh, uh, its coupling, which, as we know, is linear uh, in this plot here. So there is a prediction from the standard model, which is this red line, this uh, fit, uh, let's say. And we see that measurements uh, align uh, exactly as predicted by the right standard model. So there is an interesting coincidence, right, in the standard model. If you take the scales, uh, which are the heaviest scale in the standard model, and you take successive rates, you get always the square root of 2. Hmm? So the V over MT, MT over MX, MX over MV is always the square root of 2. We don't know why. If anybody has an idea, can tell me in private uh, after that I can write a paper on it. But as far as I know, there is no explanation for this. Maybe it's just a coincidence. Anyway, so there are missing uh, uh, point in this plot, right? There are uh, inf there is information which is missing. One information which is missing is the fact that we don't have information on the first and second generation. The other one is that we don't know yet, uh, even though we know the mass of the X very well, we don't know anything about the form of the potential, about the self interaction of the X. So, how can the EFT help? in this search, for example. Well, there is a way which is very easy, actually, to understand in terms of NFT. So imagine that there is some new physics which modifies the potential of the standard model for which everything is fixed, as you remember. All couplings are fixed in the standard model. So how am I going to deform in a consistent way, in a SU2 consistent way, the potential of the X so that it could mean effects coming from heavier states? Well, the simplest way is to add a tower of operators, which are singlets under SU2, uh, all, actually under all gauge uh, symmetries of standard model, which uh, uh, have, are higher dimensional and uh, are regulated by a Wilson coefficient, exactly as I said before. So if I add one of them, then I will, I will detach, if you want, I will decouple the mass of the X from the self couplings. If I add two of them, I will decouple the mass of the X, the, the three linear coupling, and the quadrilinear coupling. So this is a consistent framework where I can do even loop computations and having consistent results uh, by deforming the standard model. That, that's what uh, people have done. So what do we learn if we do that? So what is the question that we would like to answer if we apply the formation like this? So the leading question attached 
to the potential of this is, of course, that of the baryogenesis, right? So we don't know, right? We don't understand how actually we can realize the first order transition at the beginning of the universe, which could give uh, the conditions, one of the conditions necessary to have uh, the, this asymmetry in the bubbles that then they expand uh, and in complete and fill of the universe. So if it's a second order transition, we know that in standard model we expect that. Uh, this doesn't work. We don't have the universe uh, boiling, right? We don't have bubbles, and this will not lead to first order. While we should have something like this, a barrier where the transition, you know, the, the state could transit, transit to the new minimum which will go down under a barrier, and bubbles would form. So can you achieve uh, a first order transition with a deformation as the one I shown? It's shown in this plot here. The blue line are the values of this CI, of this ratio among the, the three linear in the standard model and in this new model. Uh, and you see that in the case of blue line, you have a first order transition. Now, there are different potential. The one which I'm interested in is this 5 to the 6 the one I showed before. And you see from here that if uh, this ratio is above uh, 1.5, if you could measure it above 1.5, we could say that there is a first order transition. Okay? If it's below, so if it's close to the standard model, then this mechanism cannot be realized in this naive way as I explained. There must be something else going on. So this, why this is useful? Because it gives you a feeling on how well we will have to measure lambda free to actually be able to say something interesting about this problem. And this can be expressed in a way which is model independent, in a way which depends only on this potential. So it's extremely powerful in its simplicity. And the fact that if I'm able to measure something larger than 1.5, then boom, I say, well, this is possible. Now you have to solve the CP problem, maybe, right? I have another problem, but still I'm in, uh, I'm in a good track. However, if I'm actually able to measure something below, then I exclude it. So I call this the point where I will learn something about a measurement. So are we there? No, we are not there. Right? We are very far from this limit. Why? Well, because it's so difficult to measure this coupling. And the reason why it's so difficult than LXC is that we normally think about this measurement by producing two heats. So there is a wide expertise in the audience about this process. And this, when you measure, when you produce two heats, you always have a self-interaction. Unfortunately, you also always have the one with no self-interaction. So, and they typically even interfere destructively. So unfortunately, this cross-section is small and it's actually most of the time weakly dependent on this coupling. So this game is very difficult. So to give you an order of magnitude, the single X cross-section is roughly 50 picomer, the double X is 1,000 smaller, and the triple X is 1,000 times smaller. So it's a super difficult game uh, to play, but that's what the next 10 or 15 years, one of the tasks of the next 15 years. There are results of this already, this one CMS and so on. We heard uh, a nice presentation yesterday about uh, this bounce. This is not the very last one, but basically you see that the kappa lambda, so this ratio, is in between 7 and 13. Sometimes it's a minus 3 and 10. But basically the message is we are very far from 1.5. We have a long way to go to actually learn something from this sensitivity plot. Right. So this is not yet a measurement. It's a sensitivity uh, indication because we are not, we have no model, right, where kappa lambda is as big as 13 or so on. So we have not yet bound it to, to uh, in great detail. So this is one example, and one is simple example because basically there is only one or two operators which contribute to an observable. Now the game will start to be more complicated, but I want. To, I want you to appreciate it because uh, it's, uh, it's something that will keep us busy for a while and where there is a lot of work to do from all levels, from the level of prediction, but also from the level of 
strategies, implementation, Monte Carlos, you name it. So it's a, it's a mind for work for the young generation. So we go back to my list of uh, couplings. We talked about the Higgs coupling, the top interaction to the gauge boson and the Higgs. And then we said that for these two items here, we are still far from, from uh, having something which is useful. So what are the particles we could focus our attention on? Well, very simple, the heaviest. The heaviest simply because the coupling between these particles have not been studied in great detail in the accelerators before. Simply because we didn't have enough energy to produce top Higgs and W and Z together. Okay? So the LHC era is the first time we actually produce all these states together when we can actually measure and constrain the coupling among these particles. So this is a plot uh, of Kenny Maso. I always uh, show it because it's beautiful. Uh, so Ken is sitting there. So this, I acknowledge uh, your, your uh, artistic uh, uh, representation of the problem, which, uh, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a slide, you s immediately understand the issue. And the issue is that if you know how experimental collaboration with Atlas and CMS work, and how also we work, right, when we write papers on uh, searches, on measurements, and so on, we write a paper on top, on TT bar, we write a paper on, on the Higgs, or on the W coupling, soft coupling, and so on, when we talk about measurement and, and, uh, and anything. However, when we think in terms of a T, everything is related with uh, anything else. And typically, whenever you make a measurement of top, you will also have to talk to the Higgs sooner or later. Whenever you, and in the same way with electroweak bosons, and vice versa. In fact, the most interesting processes where we learn the most are those in the, in the intersection of two or even three of these uh, regions of work, right, on these work packages, let's say. And so I, I will make an example in the following, which exactly sits in the middle of this plot, just to show you that somewhat this approach forces us to think in another way, forces us to work and with our fellow experimentalists in a global way, in a way that we have never worked so far uh, in this way. So it's a new territory in that respect. And uh, if you follow the bit of discussion that are going on in the meetings uh, at CERN or uh, everywhere in the world, people are really reacting uh, in all possible reaction to this because it's really new, right? So people are uh, not comfortable with uh, working, for example, in this way. If you tell an experimentalist measuring the Kitty Mark cross section that he has to present the results in, in a way that someone doing W measurement we can use, uh, uh, it starts to be, um, you know, uh, disturbed by this, and so on. So this demands a different way of thinking and a different way of working, which is really uh, at the basis of this approach. And if we make it, uh, we will change the way the measurement can be interpreted in the legacy. So how does it work? So I'm, uh, from the nice representation, I'm showing you now a table, which is much less poetic than the plot, but is the same more uh, clear if you can read it. So if I list uh, the operator on the, on the columns, then I can list the processes which I cannot access in the LHC, and then I can make a table, right, where each operator enters which process, in particular, some observable uh, associated to the measurement of this process. So, as I said, for each observable, you may have more operators entering. So I have somewhat a metric, which, uh, roughly speaking, I have to diagonalize to get information. So how does, so this is L is leading order, N is next to leading order. It means that the sum operators enter only when they go next to leading order in QCD. So instead of taking the general case, let me give you two examples, two simplified examples. One is not so simple, actually. So one is meant to, to, for you to understand the principle, the way we think, 
Another one is to appreciate the strategy. So in the first one, I pick three operators. So for most of you, this will not tell you anything because they are somewhat encoded. But to people working on this, as I said, this we call the Yukawa. You see, this is a Yukawa interaction. I just add a singlet of SU2, which is dimension two. So over all this dimension six. And what does this operator do? One very simple thing. It breaks the relation between the Yukawa and the mass in the standard model. So now, after you added this operator, the Yukawa can take any value, and the mass can take any value. They're not related anymore. So I'm deforming the standard model. So this is a GG operator. So this uh, relates the Higgs uh, with the gluons directly. And this uh, so-called chromomagnetic is a, a dipole. It's a loop-induced operator in general. And uh, it's there because it mixes, actually, with this other operator. So this family, I cannot break it. It's a very united family because uh, they mix under RG. So I cannot pick one and forget about the others. Because they're low energy, they will mix in one into another. So how do I disentangle this? Well, I have three degrees of freedom, so I need enough observables to make this fit. So what can I look for? I can look at TT bar X, single X, for example, single X plus one jet, and double X. In fact, I need only three, because I'm three operator. So let me do it first. So let's think about GG, right, rule fusion. Rule fusion, for the total inclusive cross-section, I have two operators which enter. I have the Yukawa, which comes in the loop, and I have also the contact interaction, which I showed before. So now you see I have a problem. Even if I have enough observable, one of them is degenerate. Because uh, in two, two coefficients, so two operators enter to the same observable. So unless I have another one which can break this degeneracy, I will not solve the system. So this degeneracy is shown here in an approximate way. This direction is constrained, right? The sum of the two is constrained. But the difference, so to speak, between the two is unconstrained. So what can I do? Well, I can think of a process where I can resolve whether there is a loop of top or not. So if I'm probing the system with a wavelength that is small enough that I can tell if uh, something is going on in the loop or not, then I can add it right, to my fitting, to my observable. And that's exactly what the one extra jet does. The one extra jet, if the PT of this gluon is very high, its wavelength is very short, that means it's like in, acting like a microscope where I can see the loop or not if there is no loop to see at that scale. So that is shown in this plot, a very high PT, the prediction of these two diagrams, two processes, are different. So I can constrain one and the other, and I can break this degeneracy and making it more like a long ellipse, a short one. Then I can look at TT bar X, where all three operators enter. I plot it. This is an old plot uh, done by Celine, the grand. And you see that even in this case, the degeneracies in one case are not aligned with the degeneracies in the other. So again, as you are used to see in these plots uh, for flavor, by combining different measurements, we can break this degeneracy. This is shown in this plot, which are two by two uh, fits. And you see that with low luminosity from the LHC, right, from the LHC run two, we cannot break them yet. But if we go at high luminosity, we will have regions, we will have regions where which allow us to break these ellipses, are all ellipses, actually, uh, which look like degenerate because they're closing very far. And these are ellipses which uh, overlap there. So the game is we can actually fit all three by using this operator. So what do we learn at that point? How do we use this information? Well, now the first place where you can use this information, which is critical for what I said before, is exactly the Higgs self-coupling. Why? Because if you look at the production of the Higgs, of, uh, of double Higgs, uh, you will recognize immediately that all these three operators, which I mentioned before, do enter 
in this process. So if my goal is to measure the three linear coupling, I cannot avoid knowing whether these other couplings which enter in this process are constrained or not. Because if I don't know that, I will never be able to constrain the, the three linear coupling by only looking at this process. So this that seemed uh, an academic exercise to see whether the top or the X couple in, in, uh, in the right way as direct measurement we usually know from, it becomes essential if you actually want to know something about the three linear. Why? Again, because all these deformations enter also in double helix. So why we have ignored them so far? Why nobody talks about this? Well, well, maybe some didn't appreciate this fact. I think it's a small number now. But the other point is that actually if you look in the detail, um, this is a plot which is a bit difficult to explain, so I will not. But basically the message is that if you, this is a, this a, a violet purple line, is that the fact that our ignorance about the trilinear is so big uh, that somewhat uh, the fact that we don't know perfectly the X coupling to the top is not, you know, is not relevant right now. So we know them well enough uh, right now so that any bound that we can find on the trilinear is actually meaningful. But whether we will be in this situation or not in three years from now, in five years from now, in ten years from now, is not at all clear. Because uh, the measurement on the top will improve uh, enormously uh, on the top coupling. And the heats uh, also will improve uh, very much. Uh, and possibly more than the one on the top, because the top at some point will be limited by systematics, while for the triple X, we are still limited by statistics. So as our luminosity improve, we will get much better in the three linear, maybe before we get better on this other coupling, unless we fully dedicate it to them. So this is a very important message, and also gives you the idea that once you think globally, you have to really think in this way. You really have a global view of what's going on. The other example I want to give uh, is about the, the, the electroweak coupling on the top. Huh? So there are many ways that in the LXC which we can measure them. I focus on this process now. Uh, this is single top plus a Z or a jet. Huh? Why it's interesting? Well, because it sits exactly in the central point of Ken's plot. It's in the process which actually talks to everybody else in this electroweak uh, game. So why so? Because you see, in this process, the X can couple to the W, but the X can couple also to the top. So it's a process where both couplings and their relative phase uh, matters. And once you actually add the operators, you look at which operators uh, enter here, you also have interactions of four points interaction of this kind, which are not present in the standard model, or and even the four fermion operators entering this process. So this uh, final state links all the electroweak sector with the top, all the T, W, right, T, W, V, if you ask a Z now, is a similar process, a um, similar characteristic, and the Higgs. So, it's a complicated one, but somewhat very representative. So how do we think about it? We think in a hierarchical way. So what is the strategy? The strategy is that we recognize subsets of processes which can build information like we did for the double X before. Right? Our goal was the double X. We used single X, TT bar X to constrain all the stuff we didn't want to be bothered with in double X. Here is the same. We will use single top to fix uh, this operator. We will use uh, VH and VBF to fix this set and uh, double weak flows of production for this. And then basically we will be left with uh, only a few operators. One of them enters in TH and also its phase enters in TH and the other in TZJ. So we are simplifying the problem in a hierarchical way. Of course, if you do a global fit, 
this will be automatic from the feed, you don't need to know this, but it's nice to understand what is our underlying strategy. So we use processes which are larger and larger cross-section to bound them. So we did this study with Luke and Ken. Uh, there are this very beautiful plot which I, I let Luca explain or can explain during the lecture. So whoever is interested uh, uh, can join the lecture tomorrow. Uh, these are somewhat a way of picturing how much each of these operators enter, or how much this, each process is sensitive to this operator in a fair way. So trying to compare them in a way that is somewhat uh, not so sensitive to the uh, normalization of each operator, which is somewhat arbitrary. OK, so why, why I'm talking about all of this uh, now, right, in this moment? Well, because uh, people in the last years, and people who have been working on this, uh, on this framework, have realized that we need uh, to improve it. So we need, as much as we need uh, to have uh, precise prediction for the standard model, we need to have precise prediction on the EFT side to be able to play this game, to, to make this global fit in a uh, reliable way. Why? Because basically, you realize very quickly that the structure of this map becomes visible, becomes manifest, only when you go one order in perturbation theory. Exactly as in the standard model where you do a linear computation, you don't control the computation, you don't know if the normalization is correct or not, you don't control the uncertainties and so on. In the EFT is the same. Your structure, the mixing, the uh, accuracy on the normalization and so on, becomes available only in the extreme order. So there has been a, la a large effort to at least compute a complete set of QCD corrections and some of the electroweak in the last uh, five years, uh, which has gone uh, pretty far. We now control, basically, the next to leading order correction in QCD. So there are various reasons for doing that. I'm not going to detail now. But one very interesting one, which I would like you to appreciate, is the fact that when you go next to leading order, as we are used to in the standard model, new things happen. I remind you that the largest production rate for the X and LXE is a loop process, is a quantum process. And that's the same even in the EFT. Even an E plus E minus collider, for example, here, you can have Higgs plus V, and this can be mediated by a loop of top. So Higgs plus Z, VH associated production, which we always understand in terms of, of measuring the VH coupling, can be also used to measure the top to the V boson of the top to the X coupling, and if we had a precision measurement sufficiently accurate. So this, again, gives you a feeling that the game plays if uh, even processes which don't know about some coupling and leading order can be used uh, to learn something about couplings which enter into one loop. So one glaring example of this is some work that we did in collaboration with Ambresh, Shivashi is at school as a teacher. We thought, well, maybe we can get some information on the three linear coupling of the X, not for double X production, when it enters at three level, let's say, right, for this coupling, but maybe in single X production, if we measure the channels of single X production really accurately, we could be starting to sen be sensitive to these operators of dimension 6 and 8, which change the three linear. So we went there, and we looked at these processes. Uh, Shauran and uh, Ambresh did the computation for this in a differential way, Shauran Zhao. So we, we looked at these processes, and we checked whether you remember, I told you that there is a factor of 1,000 in cross-section between the single X and the double X. So the effect, these effects are very small, but I have 1,000 more statistics there to, to use. So what is the trade-off? Well, where do you gain? Is, is this hopeless or is competitive? And surprisingly, at least to us, well, we were hopeful, of course, that this would be competitive, but we didn't know when we started. Um, it turns out 
So this is a, 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 a feat done by Atlas. This was presented one month ago, so it's very new. And on the left-hand side, you see the constraints you get from these indirect, indirect measurements as a global fit of the coupling of the X. It's a bit like this singlet, which I was talking before. You only have one parameter, it's lambda 3, and then you fit all the rates of the X, and the, cap, and the constraints of kappa lambda is 4 plus or minus 4. Is it good? No, right? We would like to be better than that. But is it good with respect to double X now? Well, yeah. Because I showed you before, we were talking about plus 10, minus 10, plus, you know, minus 3, and plus 3. So it's competitive. It's not better, really, because the uncertainties are really large, but it's competitive. And you can show that it's competitive because when you combine it with double X, actually, you get something better. So this is, again, the fact that when we go to precision, and in this case, we use the EFT, then we have something to gain by reinterpreting the, the measurement for which we have a large statistics compared to those which are limited in statistics. So there is a great power in this kind of approach, uh, which somewhat has to be still to exploit. Right? We just have to think about it. This plot, uh, which I show, is a paper by Eleni and Sen of last year. It's brand new. Nobody had thought about this before. So just to give you the feeling that there is a lot to do here. OK, so what is the progress technically? And I'm, I'm heading towards uh, uh, the end of this uh, uh, colloquium uh, and in thermal minutes. So I just a list is not representative fully. There are other papers from other collaboration. I'm just, I just showing those somewhat related to the top and the heat in the last year. So if you see there is an acceleration in the results, this is because the technology has improved and we are getting to the point that we can compute uh, any of this uh, cross-section and next to reading order accuracy. And this allows us basically to explore finally all final states like TZJ or TXJ, which we were not able to do only two or three years ago. So we also uh, improved, let's say, well-known processes like dual heaps. This was a two-loop computation uh, done again by the same group as before uh, together. So this, you know, we had to ask help from uh, people who know how to do two-loop computation uh, as, a, as a way of living, right? So there is also room for people doing multi-loop computation to improve here, to contribute. And now we can cover all these processes that uh, I mentioned uh, before. So what is the status? Well, the status is that we have a model. What, so we have a, uh, no, I'm not going to the detail now, but we have somewhat an almost complete implementation of this map at NLO. Uh, some of it is still under validation. But basically, we have been able to put together, uh, these, these people here have been able to put this together uh, and make it work. Uh, to be used directly by an experimental collaboration, for which I just received an email yesterday. Atlas is officially asking for our model uh, to be used, so we, we have to respond to that. So how does it work? So what is the so we have prepared the tool. So now how, how are we going to use them? So there is a big debate still of how we're going to do this. Uh, why? Because it's new. So we are not sure yet which way is the best one. So there is uh, the naive way. The naive way is that we don't ask anything to our experimental fellows. Uh, we only ask them to provide standard model measurement, and then we use them ourselves, and we do the fit by reproducing their standard model results and constraining our operator on the observable that they measure. This is a option number one. And option number two, instead, is that they do the fit with their data, top down. Like they fit the SUSE, they fit the EFT. So what is the advantage? Well, of course, the advantage is that they will have a much better sensitivity if they do them themselves. However, you always need some kind of approximation for them to work. And also, they're not really ready yet to do it very globally. 
So in the end, what, what's happening now, both approaches are being followed, and most probably will be followed. And this is extremely positive, because we theorists, we can work and show and prove that this is feasible, that they will gain, and experimental collaboration can also convince themselves that they can do better than us. They, their, their work is actually worth it. So that's one of these two directions. So this is one, what we did as a, as a theorist. We took a bunch of measurements, the data there. We uh, reproduced uh, uh, with theory. Of course, theory now, we, have, we need two theory. We need the standard model theory, and we need the EFT theory. The standard model theory, we need it in the most accurate way, because that will what will give us possibly deviation. And then the SMAP we use for the interpretation of possible deviations or for constraining. So we, this is one time we did another one uh, recently with another group. But basically, I'm, I'm just telling this will be a short story. I want just to highlight the, the, the fact that it's possible. So we have a theory, right, a SMAP a, a standard model. We have the data. We have uh, some kind of fitting technology which can be advanced uh, or, or very simple. This is an advanced one. Uh, so there is a full group of people who is doing this. I'm not going into detail. So what we do, we, we choose uh, the operators which somewhat mix around themselves, somewhat which form some kind of minimal basis for a given set of uh, uh, physics, new physics that we are interested in. And then we selected 34 of these operators. Not two, not three, not eight, right? 34. So it's a large number to make a fit uh, converging right now. And then we use the all information, all measurements on the standard model, which involve uh, top, in this case. It's a global top fit, uh, mostly, and test top uh, a hit. And then we list all the observables. There are 103 degrees of freedom, right? Some of these observables are wind, so they count more. So once we have uh, the data, we have, for each one of these observables, we have our theory prediction from the standard model and from the EFT. And then we do a fit. Now, making this fit is actually complicated. So uh, you know, I will need another talk uh, to explain it. And I'm not even sure I will be able to cover all details myself, uh, because it's a collaboration. There are many details that go into it. However, uh, in first approximation, right, with some choices, this is the result uh, that we get. So these are bounds. Uh, these are bounds uh, in these coefficients uh, on, on the Wilson coefficient. Some of them, those which are at this level, basically means that we are not really binding them, because we are constraining the same. We don't allow them to be uh, infinitely large. right? We somewhat bound them in the fit. Uh, so those which lie here, so what are not bounded. But you see that there is some power, right? So look, uh, look at the blue line or the red line. The red line are individual coefficient. So the, the thing that you notice from this plot is that the messenger 2, let's say, there is uh, in the data already now without any dedicated study, there is way of binding many of these, of bounding many of these operators. The red lines are individual bounds. The blue lines are global bounds, are marginalized bounds. And you see that you can have a very large difference. So all the bounds that people get one operator at a time are not really significant right, at this level, because uh, and they can be much worse, or even a factor, uh, an order of magnitude. The other thing that we notice, and this is a correlation heat plot. So when you see yellow off diagonal, it means that these operators are correlated. So the fit uh, is still somewhat the observable choice is not yet optimal, because some of these operators uh, are correlated, like uh, those I was showing with this uh, long, long ellipse. So we can improve uh, on choosing better uh, observable to try to flatten uh, this correlation. And finally, and more importantly, what we proved uh, is the fact that we can take this very large fit with 34 parameters, for which probably there is no new physics scenario that would lead to all 34 active and low scale. Right? 
So this is a, then you can think, well, now you're fitting all these things, but there is no new fixes model which actually gives all 34. Some of them will be on, some other not. So how do you use it after? Well, we proved uh, in this uh, proof of concept that you can use the result directly of this fit and restrict them to some specific scenario. So in this case, I'm using a, a top Felix scenario where some of these operators are related one with another. But what is more important, so the number of degrees of freedom now is much less, it's 19, it's almost half of them. And what we saw is that we don't have to rerun the fit to get the constraints on this parameter. So we can use the results done before to actually constrain in a reliable way also scenarios which are restricted. And not surprisingly, now you cannot compare by eye, but uh, believe me, uh, that the top, well, actually, yes, sorry. The blue line are the general one, and the orange one are the top phoenix. The, the top phoenix bounds are all better, are all better bounds with respect to the general one. So these are somewhat sanity plots, sanity checks, that the fit, the constraining power of what we are doing works. If we lower the number of degrees of freedom in a given model, the constraints get better, and our lower bound of new scale grows up. So we are now trying to uh, enlarge this to include the Higgs. We are not there yet. We have started. And uh, now this plot shows uh, what will happen once we start adding operators. Of course, for this one, we don't have the sensitivity yet. But these two operators are already constrained with the and only uh, three or five points or new uh, points in the fit. So this is uh, somewhat, one thing is the restriction. The other one, we try to enlarge the number of data set, and this seems to be giving stable results. So this somewhat gives us confidence that we can move uh, to the next step. So I run to the end. It was a, 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 long, uh, <coughs> a long talk. So, uh, well, there is a far-reaching approach, which is that of this math. Uh, I think it's new. I mean, this, uh, this way of thinking is new. So when something is new, uh, it does good and bad things. It's exciting because there are many things to do here. And of course, uh, it's also, as you've seen, still at this infancy. We're still checking whether the fit works or not, right? So before we actually giving, we'll be able to give uh, physical result of interpretation, it will take a little bit more time. But so what uh, different groups are working on it, and all different groups are all showing only my, my results, our results, are leading, uh, are showing that that's the good way to go. So I hope you join. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Fabio, uh, for excellent uh, presentation of what we have been doing. I question is open for questions. Maybe you can ask what you like. Any questions, comments? You collaborate. How oh, easy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That one. So, so what? What did they add in the left-hand side? Just Higgs signal strengths, or on the left-hand side? Yeah. What? Yeah. Did they? Yeah. So they, what they did is, uh, uh, I have a slide. Let me show it. So, oops, sorry. Um, so basically, I mean, that's not exactly what they've done because they use their own fit, but the, the, the philosophy is the same. So imagine that you take all this uh, measurement, right, of uh, sigmatized marriage ratio, that's called mu's. Right. So uh, the mu's are the departure with respect to the standard model prediction 
of rays. So it's simple transparency ratio. And if uh, uh, you have only standard model, you will get one for all of them. So you go ahead, I mean, the experimentalists go ahead, use an old plot by around one, and then you measure all this uh, rate by making a global effect. And then this is the result, right? This is the result of the experimental collaboration, which measures all these number of events in each of these means. So what uh, they do after, they combine the contribution from all these loop diagram, which enter in TTMARIX, GLU, GLU, uh, WZ, WX, uh, ZX, and VDF. Each of these coefficients is different. So given a lambda, the deformation on each of these is different. So in fact, this gives some kind of structure which uh, um, you can even uh, show here. Well, if I will I be able, sorry, let's keep slide. So on each of these, so this plot now is on the horizontal axis. Every mean here is a, a rate. So this production times this ratio. So if I use lambda, uh, so kappa lambda equal to 14, I therefore I get a rate which is much lower. And then for TT bar X is actually bigger. So you deform this prediction depending on, the va on, on one parameter. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, oh sorry. See, now I have to stop it. Cool. So you see, by me, you see it. Well, yeah. I'm not fast enough to, block, to stop it, but <laughs> OK. Anyway, so you see that if I change lambda, this pattern is deformed in a unique way. It's one parameter fit of many points, right? So this means, again, if you had only one process, you never have the sensitivity. But the fact that at each lambda, you have some kind of unique deformation enhances your sensitivity enormously. And then you are able, you are able to fit uh, to fit lambda, OK, here. So this is only done with the, with the technique I've shown before. So it's profiled over all the other kappas. Yeah, with one parameter fit. So you set all the other kappa of the standard model equal to 1. And yes. You, you put all the other kappas to one, and then you measure this. It's and the rationale is, yeah. It's not profiled over the other kappas. No. Then what they did, though, is the profiling over kappa t and kappa v. Yeah. So they also have the plots with kappa t and kappa v. Yeah. Where? And, uh, is Here? it possible to actually pin down uh, what is the new physics? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, so, OK, there are two levels. First, uh, uh, the first level is imagine that there is a, a deviate, like a bit like uh, this uh, flavor violation in B physics. Right? It's similar. So imagine that there is a deviation in one observable. Then what you do, you try to see with the EFT what kind of operators enter in that observable, and then see what other observable will be influenced by that, the same one, in a model independent way. Because now, this is predictive somewhat. If you see something there, uh, at least uh, some other observable which has uh, the same operator, if it's sensitive enough, will show a deviation. So the first step is model independent. And that would allow you to identify the class of observable, uh, the, the set of uh, operators which uh, are responsible for the deviation. So that would be step one, right? And then what you would do is that you would try to find a model which, in the infrared, switches off, uh, switches on this operator or more, right? But those, the others may be less. Uh, impacting observables, so that you never map uh, top down. Right? So in fact, you have to go anyway up uh, bottom up. 
but the, 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 the philosophy is that the first step will be completely model independent and would allow you to gather more information that otherwise you would be blind off uh, when trying to build the ultraviolet completion. So it's somewhat helping your, your way, right? This will allow you to tell also where you should look for before knowing the full model, just because of the operator. And then once you know, once you have a better picture, then you, have, you would have several operators, and then so what would be the footprint of something living in the ultraviolet? That's the strategy, very basically. So I'm, I'm, I'm still back to the King's question. Um, so the intellect, is, uh, intellect constraint and intellect constraint for lambda, kappa lambda, do you have expectations uh, for the high luminosity HC? Uh, they are still similar, or someone is better than others? So from the, I expect that double Higgs will improve more mm -hmm. than, than single Higgs, because of, of what I was saying before, that to some extent, uh, uh, the other coupling of Higgs are almost not matter anymore. About, I mean, they're not bounded by statistics. The amount of systematics. However, it's not obvious, right, how well we also improve systematics. That you never know because uh, people say, you know, it doesn't improve statistics. But in fact, it always improves statistics, also systematics. Because you use a control easier, you, you always improve uh, almost in the same scaling, actually. So uh, the estimates now are that double X will catch up with respect to single X. So we will get better, faster than single leaks. Mm -hmm. But so I don't know, right? Uh, uh, you know, we will see. Okay. We will anyway. At the end of the day, we should be get close. So if you want a number at the end of the fine, uh, at the end of LHC, I Lumi, we should get into the interesting region. Right? We should get close one enough uh, that we can say something at least about the naive uh, uh, first order transition problem, if you are lucky. Any other questions? Yeah, one more. Does the new physics only interact with the third generation? And now, in this fit? Mm -hmm. In this fit, yes, basically. Oh, maybe the almost final bit, uh, new hypothesis, uh, new physics is only interact yeah. with the third generation? And well, we, yeah, uh, I'll let you finish. Uh, uh, and you got the more serious constraint on the with so called efficiency. So I'm not, okay, let, let me answer it for another question and then we'll see if we can convert it. So, the, uh, so as I said, you need some kind of flavor structure, flavor hypothesis when we do this. So the naive one, the most basic one, is to say that new physics is flavor universal. Okay. But in that case, there is no reason to do measurements for the top. Because uh, basically, uh, all measurements of the precision measurement in the Z, right, electroweak measurement with the light works, are very well constrained, right? And, uh, uh, and then uh, the, the Higgs, in any case, uh, uh, the only thing you can measure is the Yukawa, no? which, uh, which you know somewhat already now. So the, the, the main point, uh, this becomes interesting at LHC, if you somewhat uh, assume that the uh, top, so the heaviest particle, have something to do with new physics, right? Because otherwise you, use a, a, you just use universal flavor and then you get very tight constraints from, uh, uh, from lab or low energy experiments, right? Low energy measurement. So it's somewhat, I mean, it's still, a, it's still being done, right? But somewhat it's less interesting for someone like me who likes top, right? So this is a, yes, there is a bias here. But so what is the bias that we all uh, we all have whenever we do a measurement in top? We you know believe it or not, we all have that bias because otherwise uh, 
there will be no reason to say that the top is different from the up. Right? So if you believe that there is something going on which has to do with the top and not with the up, then you can have a flavor, uh, a flavor assignment, a flavor hypothesis which reflects that, and that's what we are using. That's a very good question. Okay, I think uh, you know, yeah, yeah. So let's close the session by thanking Fabio. Thank you. Um,